morning, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be visiting you from South Africa. I'd like to thank the organizing committee, Professor Buzid in particular, um, for having me. Um, and I'd like to congratulate all the previous speakers in this um, session. Um, it's really nice to be able to um, hopefully bring everything together that's actually been said. Um, because we had very common and overlapping themes. So I'm going to speak about quality improvement and particularly talk about the role of the International Quality Improvement Collaborative and um, the Protea project. Um, let me just see if I move this forward. There we go. Um, so I would like to start by um, inviting you all to um, a Congress next year. So this is the Pan-African Society of Cardiology Congress. Um, it's happening in South Africa in collaboration with the South African Heart Association Congress. And the important thing about it is that it actually speaks to the issue of ne meeting the cardiovascular needs of Africa. Um, this is the hospital that I come from. This is Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town. Um, and we work together with the Children's Hospital Trust um, to provide buildings and, um, co and community care. This is the other hospital that I work at, that is the Grutskir Hospital, that is obviously very well known amongst all of you for the first um, heart transplant, now just over 50 uh, years ago. And all of these will be brought together in this Congress next year, which will be happening in Johannesburg. Um, and one of the big things about these kind of congresses is that, is that it brings together the intellectual um, capacity to be able to meet the cardiovascular needs of Africa. And so I certainly invite you all very warmly to attend um, and um, share your interesting experiences. So if we look at um, the uh, congenital heart disease prevalence around the world, and it's very interesting that the papers that have been uh, written about this have always shown that the congenital heart disease birth prevalence in Africa is much less than in every other continent. But you heard very nicely from um, one of my previous speakers um, that incidence is not different in any part of the world. The only difference is that we haven't written about it and we're not disseminating it. What we do know is that the birth prevalence for congenital heart disease is increasing decade upon decade. And if we look at what's happening in terms of mortality, and we look at the various um, colors presenting here on this graph on the right, which is each one of the bands of um, decades, you can see that the, um, the graph is moving quite dramatically to the right, where you see increasing survival rates in every mortality uh, across the board. We can see this in these um, papers as well. The one on the left is from Finland, the one on the right is from, J from Japan. And again, it shows very clearly that we are seeing a very new transition with increasing um, survival rates and decreasing mortality. And this is even if you have um, uh, the look at the differences between simple, medium, and moderate. If you look at this graph, you'll see just very cool in the corner on the right, um, is the differences in the different um, decades. So between 1950s and 1980s, you see um, survival rates um, for the severe is less than 50%. But if you look at the same categories now, up to 2009, survival rates within 20 years is still above 80%. So really we're dealing with a transition in congenital heart disease and in particular in neonatal um, outcomes. If you look at this paper in a bit more, um, uh, a bit closer, it looks at the different operations that neonates are particularly um, uh, prone to having. So the palliative ones, a pulmonary artery banding or um, systemic pulmonary shunt, and then the bigger operations, arterial switch and the Norwood, which you just heard so nicely about now. This also gives us the opportunity to benchmark and compare our results to other results. And this is comparing one of the units um, in America to the STS registry, which we also heard about um, earlier. However, it's always important for us to realize that those of us living in low and middle income countries face very different complexities and very different challenges. This is um, a graph I actually showed you last time, uh, congenital heart um, anomalies. Uh, this is death from congenital heart anomalies, of which the profound cause is um, congenital heart disease, and this comes from the Global Burden of Disease data. 
And when we looked at um, Algeria, we had 3.9 deaths per 100,000. And we looked at South Africa, it was 1.7 deaths per 100,000. But you can see if you look at other parts of Africa, it's profoundly worse. So um, this leads us to the major issue, and I'm so pleased that there's so many congenital cardiac surgeons here, because we face a very different challenge when it comes to congenital cardiac surgery. The um, countries in the darker shading are countries that not only perform more than 500 cases a year, but also provide comprehensive training of a heart team. The ones that are um, hatched are those that have between 100 and 500 cases with some training, but the rest of Africa have neither. So when we look at quality, um, one of the most important things of a center's experience and expertise in pedi pediatric cardiovascular surgery is the quality of outcomes. And sometimes we think about quality just in terms of numbers, um, but it's very important that we think about it in terms of quality and then moving on to how we can improve our practice so that we can improve outcomes. So if we look at what people define as quality, what is quality healthcare? Well, it's just defined usually in six areas. It's patient and person-centered, efficient, effective, equitable, timely, and safe. And it's important for you to recognize all of those six um, work perfectly when we think of neonatal and, co and um, congenital heart disease surgery. Um, another way of looking at it is in these four categories. So first planning, then doing, then studying, and then acting. So planning to see what is the problem and what can we do about it, in, uh, execu um, executing the plan, then studying the outcomes of that plan, and then acting in the most appropriate way. So this leads me to the International Quality Improvement Collaborative for Congenital Heart Disease, which we've been a part of for the last two years, and which we've known about for many, many years. It speaks to improving care in low and middle income countries. So it was developed by Kathy Jenkins and the Boston team to improve quality in cardiac surgery programs in developing countries. And the aims in particular are to create tailored quality improvement strategies and all of these are to reduce mortality as well as major complications. It populates a database, and we heard so well from um, Professor Al Rassi how important it is to have a database. But these are also not just to uh, quantify our program, but also to track clinical outcomes of both in hospital mortality, 30 day mortality, surgical site and bloodstream infections, as well as other critical indicators for congenital heart surgery. At the moment, there are only over 85,000 surgical cases from 56 surgical sites in 24 countries in this database. And this is just a, a map to illustrate the countries that are currently in the database. Importantly, in Africa, we've got Uganda, Tanzania, and South Africa, and the rest of Africa that are doing surgical programs are not included at the moment. Important for me to mention at this point that entering the database is entirely without cost um, and the only local costs are really to have somebody to enter the data for you. So we all know about the STS database and um, this was a 2018 update and again it looked particularly at mortality um, and provided all of these opportunities, assessment of performance, benchmarking, development and application of the risk adjustment models, um, highlighting quality improvement initiatives and providing research. And in America, it also relates to government and regulatory collaborations as well as reimbursement. And these are the kind of numbers that the STS registry has been able to provide, which is looking at some of the classic um, operations done. There's the RTL switch operation, the Norwood operation. Um, and you can see we go through the race score ventricular septal defect repairs, 0.6% mortality, um, AVSD, slightly more complicated, 2.7, then you've got the arterial switch at 2.2 and all the way through to the Nord at 15.8. The important thing is that STS registry has not only helped in terms of quantifying outcomes and mortality rates, but has also helped um, to be able to give effective um, communication to our patients around informed consent. So when we look at complication rates and we use the STS registry and we are speaking to a patient whose um, child is going to have a truncus operation, we can say you've got a very high opportunity 
based on our registry of reoperation or cath rate as opposed to, for example, a permanent pacemaker placement, which you don't have a very high um, rate of complications. So these are very important methods that we can use registries. And so back again to the IQIC. So this is what you receive. You receive a semi-annual data summary. Um, you get this twice a year. And in there you see aggregate data, so data for the entire, um, all the patients involved in the register. You see your own individual data as well as summary data. And then you've got unadjusted as well as adjusted rates for in-hospital mortality, 30-day mortality, surgical site infection, bacterial sepsis, any infection, of course the RACS adjustment score, and standardized mortality rates. The other important thing is that you have an opportunity to learn from the IQIC. So what they present as learning modules, these are multiple webinars, um, downloadable talks, um, and active talks that you can um, join. And for example, um, things like clear communication and effective teamwork, how do we um, undertake a safe bypass and how do we discharge our patients. So very important uh, learning modules that are downloadable for anybody um, to, to use. This is a congenital heart disease surgery checklist, which I'm sure many people in this, in this room use, but if not, it's there to be downloaded and be used in your unit. I'm just going to present a few of the data. So this is some aggregate data for 2017, and it showed, taking into consideration the theme of this um, seminar, that 6% of all of the patients that were entered into the 2017 data were, un were neonates. If we compare that with our South African data, 9% um, of our patients are neonates. And it was interesting to see a very different um, demographic from the um, Lebanese um, data as much as 23%. This was our sex distribution, which was very much similar but it's interesting to see that certain units find that very different. Looking at our comorbidities, and this is all aggregate data, I found it very interesting that major non-cardiac structural anomalies, major chromosomal anomalies, and major medical illness was very low, between 2 and 5%. If you look at the RAC score, you can see 18% um, were at RAC1, 50% of the operations done in 2017 were RACS 2, and then you've got RACS 3 to 6 uh, represented in the different colors. The total in hospital mortality was 4.2%. This is across all of the developing countries. 30 day mortality, 5.1%, and then loss to follow up, 9.8%. This is a very important um, number, the 9.8%, and a very important variable that people often forget. So it's it's easy to say what your in-hospital mortality rate and your 30-day mortality rate, but how much of those patients do we follow up long-term? And for those of us working in low- and middle-income countries, we know that this is a very difficult area. So it just points out how important it is. We do not know what's happened to those 10% of patients. If we look at the mortality rate over the time, you can see that the mortality rate has generally been dropping in quite a significant way. So if we look at our own data, and this is from um, the Red Cross Children's Hospital, some of the areas that we found particularly interesting. So we've never really looked before in detail at what our patients' um, weight, height, and um, nutritional status was before they went into surgery. We had a sense in Aitley that they were um, undernourished, but we hadn't actually those numbers. And here we could see 38% of our cohort were malnourished, <laughs> and 14% were emaciated. This has got significant um, associations with outcomes. If we look at the RAC score, you can see it's a little bit different with more complicated surgery being done at Red Cross. And yet, we have a very different demographic. Many of our patients don't come from our province, they come from neighboring provinces um, where there's very little care and they travel a long way to come to surgery. And so you see, we um, see major non-cardiac structural anomalies, 5%, major medical illness, 13%, prematurity, 11%, and major chromosomal abnormalities, 23.5%. 
We um, operate on virtually every chromosomal anomaly outside of the lethal ones, um, but none of the other centers in the country operate on patients with, 20, with trisomy 21. And so often they travel down to Cape Town for their surgery. So we're also seeing a very different demographic there. If we look at the total numbers then in 2017, we can see um, that most of our mortality was in um, RAX4. The aggregate, as I've mentioned before, neonates about 6%. Our ones in 2017, we had a mortality rate that went up to, nine, to 7%. Our 30-day mortality was 9.2%, but 15% of our patients were lost to follow up. In 2018, our mortality rate has dropped significantly down to 2.6% with a lot of intervention happening between last year and this year, but we still have that issue with bacterial sepsis and major um, infection. If you look at the neonatal group, this is just from our group, you can see just like with many of the other um, areas, the neonates are the ones at particular risk. And again, these are the areas that we really have to focus on. So if we look at um, some of the next steps, these were the four areas that were concerning for us. We've now um, instituted a wound infection bundle, we have a new at-risk clinic, um, and we follow our patients up actively and trialing a new app to, to go look for our patients and offering those teachings and webinars to our staff. The PRATIA study, which stands for Partnerships in Congenital Heart Disease in Africa, is a multidisciplinary um, study where we've created a bespoke registry to be able to um, capture all of these very important information right from the word go. This is our bespoke um, registry, which you can see looks at all of the various aspects, but does so in a very comprehensive and densely phenotyped way. This is our website, um, and we discuss all of our various areas of research on this website. And I welcome you to, um, to have a look and maybe join us and find out more and look at some of the news that we have on this website. Um, you'll probably see a few of your photographs on there very soon. Uh, the red um, card is the passport that we've introduced. And that, again, is one of the areas that we actually can maintain connections with our patients, especially after they leave, so that we don't have the same issue of a loss to follow up rate over 10%. So in conclusion then, we know that congenital heart disease is common. We think that it's 8 per thousand live births, we know that the prevalence is increasing, and we don't think it's any different in Africa. It's a global health problem, there's an innate need for surgery, especially in Africa, and the neonatal population is at least um, one that is of particular risk and that we have to focus on. In Africa, however, data is lacking. So the reported prevalence is 1.9% or 1.9 per thousand live births, and we all know that this is not what is happening. However, if we're not disseminating, if we're not um, writing about it, then we are certainly going to be lacking out of the global conversation around uh, congenital heart disease. So what do we need to do? We need to create uh, mechanisms for measurement. Um, and these are really important. One of them is, for example, the Protea Registry, again, free for those who are interested in using it. Um, and, and this is something that each one of us in our units have to um, start using um, to be able to measure what we're doing. Secondly, we have to improve the quality of what we're doing. And the quality seems to be doing well in terms of mortality rates. Obviously, we can drive that down even further. But it's also about morbidity rates, in particular around infection, around 30-day mortalities and around follow-up of our patients. The IQIC is one of the options that we can use for this. We need to continue to teach and to train and collaborate just as we're doing at the moment. And then finally, of course, building capacity for congenital heart disease in Africa. And this is for capacity building right across the entire spectrum of the um, human resources needed to address this condition in particular. So I'd like to end by thanking you all again um, for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to work together for children with heart disease in Africa, and I thank you for your attention.